My name is Oren Kerr. I'm a law professor at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. My background is in mechanical engineering. I was a mechanical engineering major in college uh, and in graduate school. Uh, and then after graduate school, I went straight to law school. Uh, my engineering background, no doubt, reflects the influence of my father, uh, a late uh, a professor of engineering, a very distinguished engineering professor uh, at the University of Delaware. Uh, and uh, after uh, I, I gave it my best try uh, in engineering, and then by the end of college and, and really by graduate school, I knew that engineering was not for me anymore. And I, I went to law school um, not really knowing very much about law. I didn't have any lawyers in the family, but uh, a lot of people had told me, you'd make a good lawyer. Uh, and I was just very interested in the material, so I thought, okay, I've gotten into a good law school and, and I should go. So, so I went to law school, clerked for a judge uh, for a year after law school, a Third Circuit judge, Leonard Garth. Uh, and then uh, I went to the Justice Department in the Honors Program, where I was a lawyer in the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section in the Criminal Division uh, for three years. Uh, so I started then teaching at George Washington University in 2001, uh, and I've been here at GW ever since. Uh, with stints to uh, clerk for Justice Kennedy and also to visiting professorships. But, but basically, I've been teaching since 2001. My academic focus is on how technology impacts criminal law and criminal procedure. Uh, and it's really a focus that I picked up while at the Justice Department. Uh, I was in a section, the computer crime section, that was dealing with the newest technologies, how criminal law was changing, uh, how the computer intrusion laws worked, uh, searching and seizing computers, and I, I picked up this specialty really by accident. It was not a plan. I didn't think at the beginning that I was going to go into this field. In fact, I was, I was basically hired by mistake into the section of the Justice Department that hired me. I was admitted into the honors program in the criminal division, and we then needed to pick a section. So the criminal division is divided into different substantive specialties. There's the fraud section and the public integrity section and the appellate section. Uh, and it was 1998 when I was trying to make this choice, when I'd just been hired or announced that, that, that I was being hired. Uh, and it was the middle of the internet boom, and I thought, computer crimes, that seems really exciting. It's computers, and I have a technical background. So I'd, I'd sign up for that, and I, I signed them up as my first choice. Uh, and it turned out they, they signed me up as their first choice, but they thought they were just bringing me in uh, to interview me. They didn't realize I'd already been hired by the criminal division in the honors program. So, so they filled out a form, which it turned out hired me uh, full time. Uh, and they then spent some time over the next few months before I arrived, apparently trying to unhire me. I guess that's the euphemistic phrase. Uh, and when I showed up, they told me they were pretty upset that I was there and they had not wanted to hire me. And unfortunately, it being the federal government, there was no form to fire me or unhire me. There was only a form to hire me. So, so they were stuck with me. Uh, so I, I was very lucky. Uh, it was a great accident because uh, I arrived at the Justice Department and in the uh, computer crime section at really an incredible time. It was just the beginning of the internet boom, and there were uh, new issues that were arising that nobody else was seeing, and I was the 17th lawyer in the computer crime section, uh, and they handed me a project that the boss of the computer crime section, you know, asked me when I started, what, what skills do you have? And I had just come from a clerkship in law school, so the frank answer was I had no skills at all. Uh, and there was a project that no one else wanted to do. Uh, which was basically to write a treatise on the law of computer crime investigations, including uh, how the Fourth Amendment applies to computers and all the electronic surveillance laws. Uh, and I explained to the section chief that I had no background in it. I didn't know anything about that subject, but uh, it was my first week on the job, and I wanted to, to you know, be a, a go-getter and impress people. With I didn't want to turn something down. So I said, sure, I'd, I'd be willing to do it. It was basically the project that nobody else in the section wanted to do. Uh, and as a result, I ended up spending you know, a lot of the time in my first year or two at the Justice Department uh, essentially writing a treatise on computer crime investigations, really starting from the beginning and trying to understand how the Fourth Amendment applied to computers, how electronic surveillance laws worked. Uh, and it was a tremendous experience because I learned a phenomenal amount about this area of law, which I thought while I was working on this, I, you know, this is going to be pretty important. You know, I, was, I was starting at the ground level in a field that most people hadn't heard of, nobody really knew what the issues were, but I was there at the beginning and, and could sort of say, all right, I want to make this my own. So, so I ended up specializing in this area when I started teaching, I uh, left the Justice Department and immediately started writing and teaching in the area of computer crime law and criminal procedure, uh, and I've stuck with that ever since.
uh, it was a, surprisingly, it was a general treatise that the computer crime section put out to try to help train prosecutors and agents at the federal level and at the state level, uh, basically to make sure that federal agents and, and state agents and everyone in law enforcement knew the basics of how to obtain electronic evidence. And you can think about the problem from a police officer's perspective. If you're a, you know, Metropolitan Police Department officer, you know what the rules are with stopping a car, you know what the rules are with arresting somebody, you know the rules for searching uh, a home or opening a package, uh, but what are the rules for searching a computer? Um, when do you need a warrant? What are the rules uh, forensically for searching a computer? Uh, what about at the border or uh, to take an issue that the Supreme Court recently granted cert on? What about incident to arrest? Everybody's carrying a very sophisticated computer in their pockets these days, a cell phone, uh, can they be searched at the moment of arrest? There's a usual rule that says they, the government is allowed to search any property on a person at the time of arrest, but does that apply to computers? There's just all sorts of issues, really the result of a, a transformation in terms of the digital evidence available. So, so you can think of it this way, I think. Um, you know, we're, we're used to the world of physical evidence, of, of the government looking for the gun or looking for uh, uh, the drugs, uh, or trying to get eyewitness testimony from a suspect. And, and we're entering this world now where more and more evidence is stored in electronic form, and that evidence is just obtained in different ways. It's, the, it's, it's data stored on a server somewhere, it's a file inside someone's cell phone or inside someone's uh, iPad or, or PC, uh, and the process of obtaining that information is different, and, and it just triggers a new set of questions as to how should the laws apply to collecting that evidence and using that evidence in court. So, so those are the issues that I, I ended up focusing on, mostly by the happenstance of starting off at this section and, and being hired essentially by, by mistake at that particular time. It's been interesting to watch over time. When I first started in the field of, I guess, computer crime law, criminal investigations involving computers in 1998, a lot of the issues that we had were theoretical questions that might arise. And we spent a lot of time thinking about these questions. You know, uh, An agent would call us and say, well, what about this problem? What do we do in this situation? And it hadn't come up in a case yet. It was just really a prospective sort of inquiry. Uh, and we started to think about those issues then, and then maybe you know, sort of think about a typical way the field has started to develop. 2001, 2002, you start to see a district court case that touched on the issue. 2005, 2006, you start seeing court of appeals cases that touch on the issue. Uh, and now, in the beginning of 2014, we're seeing circuit splits. Uh, we're seeing the Supreme Court start to take these cases. Uh, so, so the field has been evolving over the last 15 years. And, and today, now, it's recognized the, there are really interesting issues here. And, and it's clear the Supreme Court is going to have to resolve a lot of the disagreement. But, but at the time when I started, it was really just a bunch of hypotheticals we were asking ourselves and asking each other. And agents were asking us to try to get some ideas to what to do if that situ situation arose. I think the engineering background was helpful in that I knew I could understand the technology. So I thought, okay, I've got, got a master's degree in mechan mechanical engineering. I, I should be able to figure out this basic question of, of computer technology. So I had some sort of confidence that I could figure it out. And, and, and when I was working with um, tech people in the field or you know, FBI agents or, 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 or people uh, with technical backgrounds, they could look at me and think, okay, I think this guy will get it eventually. Um, but beyond that, I, I, you know, the kind of issues that I studied in, in engineering in graduate school and undergraduate were really not at all the kinds of questions that arose uh, as a lawyer. I mean, I was, I was looking at, you know, airplane design and, and fluid mechanics and, and heat transfer questions, which, which are not the kind of issues that arise in the context of searching a computer. So, so it wasn't related technological issues, but I, I suspect it was helpful just to have a technology background. No, oh, interesting. It's an interesting question, actually. Let me. Okay, here's here's the answer, um, or my answer. Um, I think it's back. It, uh, let me scratch that. I think it's helpful to have a technological background, with the caveat that a lot of what we think of as technology today will probably just be general knowledge in ten or twenty years. So, 
an example of this, I think it's always helpful to think of earlier technologies uh, in which that uh, raised some similar questions. And one of them in the Fourth Amendment area is the automobile. A uh, tremendous number of Fourth Amendment cases involve searches of cars, rules on stopping cars, when can the trunk be searched, all these questions. Um, in the turn of the century, 100 years ago, uh, or in the 1920s, these were technology questions. And, and, and you can imagine asking a justice in the 1920s or the teens, uh, you know, do you need to know how an automobile works to know how the Fourth Amendment should apply to it? And obviously you didn't need to know the internal combustion engine or how transmissions worked, uh, but you did need to know what cars did. Uh, you needed to know how fast they could go. You needed to know if they could store evidence and how, uh, just to get a sense of to what extent does the automobile change the basic rules that had applied to houses or packages or even ships uh, in, in earlier days. So that kind of understanding of what the technology does, I think that's the kind of thing that starts off as a technological question, but very quickly just becomes a societal question. And another example of this that comes to mind is how cell phones work. Um, you know, people started getting, most people started getting cell phones maybe 10 years ago, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and initially they were just sort of magical black boxes. Just how does a cell phone work? It's just magic. It just, it just connects you to the world. And, and no one really, most users didn't have a sense of that. And, and my sense is that over time it's increasingly common for users of cell phones to have some rough idea as to how the technology works. You know, there's, there's cell towers, you're, you, as a user, you turn on the phone, it connects to a cell tower, it's communicating with the cell tower. The idea that there would be records uh, from the cell tower as to where the phone is located roughly, that, that seems more intuitive as you get a better understanding of how the technology works. And so I think looked at from a historical or long-term perspective, we're at the very beginning of a computer I don't want to use the revolution because it sounds too dramatic, but a, a computer change, a computer transformation in some way, um, in which we're relying more and more on these machines. And we're at the point now where we're just getting used to that and we're just understanding how these new devices work. And these devices are changing constantly. So you know, every year right now we're seeing a new iPhone, a new computer, and we, we expect the computer we buy today to be much, much better than the computer we bought two years ago. Uh, and and his, I think over time the, the technology is likely to stabilize in that area and it will just become common knowledge as to how that works. So it, it won't be seen as a technological question, it'll just be seen as a, uh, a life question, it'll just be something you know about as you go about your daily life. I knew I wanted to clerk after law school in part because when I was in law school I just loved legal questions. I was one of those folks that enjoyed law school. I thought my classes were great. I wanted to talk about law after class and before class. Uh, and so, you know, everybody I had spoken to said, well, you should do an appellate clerkship. It's kind of like a, you know, graduate degree on top of a JD and you'll get to really experience legal questions. So, so I applied for uh, clerkships and accepted a position with uh, Judge Leonard Garth on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, who at the age of, I think, 93 now is still hearing cases. I just spoke to him a few days ago. Uh, and uh, and it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, after clerking, I remember speaking with uh, other law clerks and other folks in my law school class who'd recently been clerking. And one of the issues that we talked about was, to what extent is the law political? You know, to what extent is a judge's liberal conservative views, how much does that impact? their decisions. And I remember speaking to a law school friend who clerked on another circuit and his response was it was all political. Uh, the liberal judges voted the liberal way, the conservative judges voted the conservative way. Uh, and my experience was just completely different. Uh, Judge Garth would go where the cases took him and that's how he decides cases and it was all on the record and it was very much uh, the way things are supposed to be. The way, you know, that's 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 the sort of the sunny version of how, how law is supposed to work and, and it was how it worked. So it was, I mean, it was wonderful. He's just really I intensely involved in the process and has very strong views and is looking at the cases and is looking at the record and active in oral argument. It was a, it was a great experience. So, so that experience was really a, a heartening one in a lot of ways. It was one in which you know, gave me a lot of confidence uh, 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 about how the legal system worked. Although, as I mentioned, you know, other, other 
friends of mine had a different experience, so it really varies judge to judge. Yeah, the Supreme Court wasn't really on my radar screen when I was uh, clerking for Judge Garth. I guess it, it started to be. I, my first year law school grades were not particularly good. I didn't, I didn't get it. I was thinking of law school exams like they were engineering exams, and I wanted to find the correct engineering answer, which is a terrible approach for a law school exam. And, and by my second year, I realized what I was doing wrong. So my second and third year uh, exams were, were much better. My grades were much higher. Um, but I wasn't one of those uh, folks who aced their first year, and I wasn't on law review, and it didn't, I didn't really think applying to the Supreme Court was particularly realistic. Um, I ended up applying anyway. My, I guess I applied when I was clerking for Judge Garth, uh, and much to my astonishment, had one interview with Chief Justice Rehnquist. I think it was about nine minutes long. I was pretty clear at that point I was not going anywhere. So that was fine. That sort of restored my sense of normal order in the universe that I was not going to get that job. Uh, and then I went to the Justice Department uh, and ended up teaching for two years and then applied again uh, to clerk. And that was mostly kind of on a, on a lark. I had a friend who was a law clerk, uh, a very good friend, who, who was enjoying the job at the Supreme Court so much. And she said, why don't you apply? Uh, and I thought, okay, well, you know, I had some sort of inside connection maybe. And, and uh, uh, that was the thought. And so I applied and I didn't hear anything for about 10 months and actually had kind of forgotten that I had applied when... Uh, I got a call from a former law clerk to Justice Kennedy uh, who invited me in for an interview. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I didn't know what the interview was about uh, because I had, it had been 10 months or so uh, since I had uh, uh, applied. Uh, and I was also, it was in the middle of uh, a lot of discussions at the time I was involved in involving the Patriot Act and was doing a lot of interviews at the time about the Patriot Act. Uh, and I didn't know, you know, it was just an interview about the Patriot Act. And then I finally realized, no, this is actually a, a clerkship interview. So, so I, was, I was quite surprised by that and ended up uh, getting the job and then taking a year off from teaching and then going right back to teaching after the clerkship. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Let me think about that. So, so did I feel prepared? Um, okay, I'll answer it on, on the record as these <laughs> things go. Uh, yeah, I suppose I did feel prepared. Uh, I, I was a little bit non-traditional. I was, I had clerked for a circuit judge like most people had. Uh, and then uh, I had been a prosecutor for three years and taught for two years. So I had much more of a legal background than, than most of the law clerks. I was at a little bit of a disadvantage because there had been legal developments that everybody else had been following that I hadn't. So for example, the EDPA, the, the habeas statute had been passed in 96. Uh, and when I had taken federal courts uh, in the spring of uh, 1997, uh, Professor Fallon had said, there's this new statute, you know, don't worry about it. We're not gonna cover it much because nobody has any idea what it means. And meanwhile, the other law clerks uh, when I arrived in the fall of 2003, uh, they had all been, you know, reading all the cases. They were up on the latest cases interpreting the statute, which for me was new. So I was a little bit behind on my EDPA uh, cases. But beyond that, I mean, law, law is law. Uh, and so it was, uh, you know, I, I jumped into the work and it was, it was pretty fascinating work. The day-to-day -day, uh, job of being a law clerk in part depends on what job you have that day. So you start off doing a lot of work on uh, cert pool memos, uh, memos uh, that are to all of the justices, uh, helping them figure out whether they want to grant cert or deny cert uh, on, on particular cases before them. Uh, and in some ways, that was work that at the time I think, I think struck me as um, you know, not as valuable. It's not merits work. Sort of, you, you sort of imagine that it's working on the merits of cases is really the 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 sort of glory part of, of the job. But but uh, looking back on it, the time working on cert pool memos was actually tremendously valuable because by the end of the year, you know what the justices care about in terms of taking cases or not taking cases. Uh, and as an outsider of the Supreme Court or a sometime litigant before the Supreme Court, it's getting the Supreme Court to take cases. Uh, or trying to get them not to take cases, which in some ways is the most important thing that the lawyers do. 
So once a case is granted, there's uh, amici uh, and their merits briefs, and the quality of the lawyering at the Supreme Court is usually very good. Uh, but the merits, you know, it's up to the nine justices as to what they want to do. Um, influencing what cases the courts take and understanding that cert standard, which really gets sort of beaten into you as a law clerk, uh, was tremendously valuable looking back on it. I mean, I can certainly talk about what I think is the most important or the less important. On the merits, I think the most important ingredient are just the merits briefs. Uh, there's nothing like the opportunity of the petitioner and the respondent to speak directly to the justices. You know, every justice and every law clerk on every case is going to, they're going to read those merits briefs. Uh, and in the case of the United States, which of course has kind of an unusual position, any amicus brief that the United States files is going to be read very carefully too. And everything else is going to be read, but I think it's, it's, the, it's the party's briefs that really get underlined and just read over and over again and are really sort of, uh, they're, they're the beginning of the conversation. They really frame the conversation. Uh, oral argument plays an important role, although often it's a different role. I mean, I, th I think part of the purpose of oral argument is for the justices to see how each other comes out, uh, to get a sense of where the votes are, uh, and perhaps to try to influence some votes that may be in play. There are a lot of questions at oral argument that are kind of strategic questions, sort of, let, let me ask a question to, just in case the centered justice hasn't thought of this issue. Um, and oftentimes it's even to think about how the opinion might work. So you'll, you'll see this at, at oral arguments uh, uh, in, in some cases where uh, maybe 20 minutes into the 30 minutes of questioning, there will be a question along the lines of, let's say we write the opinion for your side or for the other side, how should we do this? And that, that's almost the beginning of the justices conference, I think, where the justices are thinking aloud, talking to each other about how to resolve the case. And th that's a tremendously important part of the process. And, and a lot of people think oral argument is, is irrelevant. I don't, I don't think so at all. I think oral argument is, is critical. It often is not as much critical to who wins or loses as it is to how the opinion comes out, which, which I think is a part of the litigation process, which, which people don't quite give the attention to that it deserves. So which side wins or loses is, is obviously very important, but is it going to be a broad opinion? Is it going to be a narrow opinion? Does the opinion write on a constitutional question, on the statutory question? Is it, you know, a case by case interstitial issue? Does the court hand down a major rule? Even issues like how are the facts described in the case? Are they described very broadly, very narrowly? Um, all of these issues go into the importance of the case, and oftentimes those sorts of questions are focused during oral argument. So I think oral argument is actually quite important. I do think oral argument has become more important. I mean, it's always interesting to go back and listen to some of the earlier uh, oral arguments from the 50s or the 60s, and they're, they're it's, it's like a landing on Mar a Martian landing on Earth or something like that. You kind of listen to it and you think, where are the justices? They're not asking any questions. And lawyers would go on for 10 minutes or 20 minutes just pontificating. And, and, and the way it works today, there's the opening statement of each side and, and maybe they get 30 seconds or a minute and it's almost sort of just to let the lawyers feel comfortable and then the questions start. And, and I, I uh, uh, argued one case uh, a case maybe I guess it was two or three years ago and I felt that my opening statement was just sort of wasted time I wanted them to get into my questions because I knew that what I was saying in my opening minute was just a summary of the points in my brief which the justices had read uh, and I, I just wanted to get on to the questions to know what they cared about to see where the justices were and, and, and sort of get a sense of where the court was. Uh, so, so oral argument has become tremendously important because so many of the justices are active. I mean, in an, in an unusual case, you know, eight justices, seven or eight justices are going to speak uh, and they're going to be part of this conversation. So it's, it's a fascinating dynamic and sometimes it's the justices themselves that are having the conversation more than the lawyer for the party. 
uh, the lawyer is, is, is involved, but there's so many questions and the justices are so interested in where they're coming from uh, that, that that's a, a, an equivalently important part of, of oral arguments. So, so I think oral arguments today are, are, are more important than they were in the past. I, I mean, I think at oral argument, the oral arguments are really about the briefs. So the briefs have framed the case and, and the justices come in with questions that they have about the briefs and, and, and the briefs really are the, they're the documents that really get it all going. The lower court opinion, the briefs, uh, important amicus briefs, uh, you know, they, and, and the court's precedents really frame each, each argument. So, so the, the oral argument is really a conversation about those materials and about the issues raised by the materials. It's, you, you couldn't as an advocate sort of bring up a new question or try a new approach. Um, so, sometimes lawyers do realize, you know, by the time they get to oral argument that the approach in their brief isn't working and they try a fallback argument or something new and, and the justices usually sort of, you know, look at them kind of funny and say, wait a minute, this is not in your brief. So, so the briefs really define the cases and, and you, know, you don't have that much time after cert is granted to write a merits brief. It's a long, thorough document and it has to be very professionally done and the window in which those briefs are written is pretty narrow. So the process is in incredibly intense and it really defines the case the moment that that brief is filed. You know, uh, an interesting way of answering this, I just think it's a little bit different from the way you're, you're posing it, is um, the role of moot courts in preparing for student court advocacy, which actually kind of gets to, to this. Um, so let, let, me, let, me, let me answer it that way. Um, one of the remarkable aspects of uh, Supreme Court arguments, and really the Supreme Court bar more broadly, is the role of moot courts. Uh, it's typical for any advocate who's going to appear before the Supreme Court to have really a series of moot courts uh, in which they prepare their arguments, they get uh, former law clerks or professors or other lawyers who've worked on the case to be you know, fake justices for purposes of the argument, and they try out their argument and then see how it works. And uh, the, the quote-unquote justices offer comments. Uh, Georgetown has a wonderful uh, Supreme Court Institute uh, that runs moot courts in almost all of the cases. They'll have a, a moot court on behalf of one of the parties. Uh, and and uh, when I had my one Supreme Court case, I think I did four moot courts. And, and it, it's marvelous for the lawyer. I mean, it really is an opportunity to try out every type of answer and to hear all the possible questions you might receive. And, and one of the most remarkable aspects of the Supreme Court bar is that any lawyer who has a Supreme Court case is going to be appearing before the justices usually doesn't have a problem putting together a pretty powerful panel of individuals who are willing to moot them. It's considered a courtesy within the Supreme Court bar to participate in a moot court in an area where you might have some expertise. Uh, and so, and it, it, it's a remarkable thing. You, you, if you have a district court argument, you don't expect other lawyers to jump out of the woodwork and say, oh, let me help you with that. But uh, when I had my oral argument, I received a tremendous amount of help from other members of the Supreme Court bar, uh, and I've helped many others uh, in, in the same way. So, so it's a surprisingly collaborative environment in which really the par part of it is for, for the, the you know, quote unquote justices, it's the fun of mooting the case and, and sort of getting into the legal issues for those who are legal nerds is pretty, pretty entertaining. Uh, but it also, it's, it's a form of public service, I think. It's a way of helping the lawyers and, and then really helping the justices and helping the law by making sure the performances at oral argument are as professional as they can be. And, and I think the, the changing importance of oral argument and the role of moot courts kind of go hand in hand. It's the fact that the oral arguments are so much better uh, and are so much more active is very much made possible by the fact that the lawyers tend to be quite prepared. They've gone through you know, a series of moot courts. There are very few questions which are out of field. They've heard it all before and they have their answer prepared. Uh, and the quality of the oral arguments at the Supreme Court today is quite high and, and remarkably higher than say in the Court of Appeals or even in the Supreme Court 20 or 30 years ago.
I think academics influence the court in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, one, one way in which the academics have had quite a significant influence in the last 10 years or so is the rise of Supreme Court clinics. Uh, uh, more and more of the court's cases, in particular in the criminal law area, have begun to be litigated by Supreme Court clinics, which typically are bringing a Supreme Court specialist uh, who has a lot of expertise, who can litigate a case quite effectively, uh, and, and, and they're taking cases that in the past would have been litigated by a solo practitioner, practitioner or someone without Supreme Court experience. So that's a role where academics are stepping in as litigators and I think are really raising the level of quality of Supreme Court advocacy. And I think particularly in the Fourth Amendment area, there have been a bunch of cases uh, with Jeff Fisher and the Stanford Supreme Court Clinic. Uh, and Jeff Fisher is just a, a terrific lawyer. His briefs are always outstanding. Uh, and, and it really helps the development of the law when individuals with that kind of skill set and expertise are able to, to litigate cases. And there's a, a very different role, I think, that are played by academic amicus briefs, and here I'm much more skeptical. Um, sometimes academics file amicus briefs where they have real expertise, uh, and they can bring some background to a problem which others can't bring. Uh, and then other academic amicus briefs are just sort of the me too, um, here's a political cause that I like kind of amicus brief. Uh, and, and, you know, from my perspective, I tend to be quite cynical of academic amicus briefs because I think the latter kind probably outnumbers the former kind. And, and I'll give you a, an example of this. On list, academic list serves when uh, law professors are proposing amicus briefs to file before courts, uh, sometimes it will happen that a lawyer will say, or a, a law professor will say, I'm thinking of writing an amicus brief. It'll be on this side. Um, would anyone be interested in working with me or joining it? And there will be a flurry of emails that follow in which other law professors say, I'll join, sign me up. Uh, and they haven't, the brief hasn't even been written yet. Uh, and they certainly haven't read the brief. And so some of the academic amicus briefs are really just individuals hoping to share, you know, to the extent that their reputations or their names have any influence on anyone inside the Supreme Court. Uh, I think it's sort of trying to push one side over the other. And, and I, I suspect the primary goal is to influence law clerks more than justices. You know, if you're a law clerk and your professor has his or her name on, a, on an amicus brief, you might think, wow, you know, Professor Smith is on this brief. I should take it really seriously. Uh, I think uh, the justices, I'm sure, are, are quite cynical and skeptical already because they see this year in and year out. Uh, and so they know to really focus on the merits of the argument, not the names that are attached to an amicus brief. I've never signed an amicus brief that I've never written. So, so my view is if my name is going to be on an amicus brief, I want to really agree with what it says. And I mean agree at the level of it's citing the right cases at the right time for the right propositions and it's not overstating issues and it's providing the appropriate context. And, and I'm, I'm you know, particular enough with that that I haven't seen a brief uh, that I haven't written that sort of met those criteria. So I'm open to others in areas that I follow closely, happening to share the same views as I do. But, but it, it seems to me that if you're going to file an amicus brief in which you, know, you, you come forward and say, I'm, I've signed this amicus brief, this is my view, that it, it should really be your view. It should be something that you, you defend. Um, and I've, I've, uh, I've had the experience of reading amicus briefs, law professor amicus briefs from the Supreme Court and being kind of surprised at a position and I've contacted individuals who signed the amicus briefs and said, so how, how can you take that view? Uh, and I remember I, I did this in a case a few, few years ago. I made a phone call to a friend of mine, or I sent, I sent an email, I guess. Uh, and the response back was, oh, did the brief say that? I, I didn't know. I didn't read it that carefully. So if the law professors are not even reading carefully the briefs with their names on it, I think it's very good reason for law clerks and judges and justices to be pretty skeptical of those briefs. Um, I mean, I think the introduction of legal blogs has had a pretty significant impact on um, commentary on the Supreme Court and commentary on the legal system. Uh, you know, it used to be that commentary was occurring either in law reviews, which of course is always delayed by a year or two, uh, or in magazines. Uh, I was recently uh, reading the, um, uh, some, some works on Alexander Bickel, the famous 
uh, uh, Yale Law professor, and, and he wrote regularly in the New Republic uh, comments on what the Supreme Court had done. And I, I think if Alexander Bickel had been around today, he'd be a, a law blogger, and he'd be a great law blogger, because he was doing es essentially what law bloggers often, often do, which is comment on the latest Supreme Court case and offer kind of an instant reaction, uh, which then goes into the mix. And, and he was writing in the New Republic, which I would imagine was being relatively widely read. And if you were really interested in Supreme Court commentary, that was a great way, way to do it. So what's changed today is, of course, it's, it's instantaneous. So a decision will come out and then the comments can start, you know, within a half hour or an hour of the new opinion coming out. Uh, and it's instantaneous and, and it, it, it can never stop. There's always as much commentary as anyone would want to hear about it. Um, in terms of how much influence it actually has, it's, it's just hard to know. I mean, I, when I was a law clerk uh, for Justice Kennedy in 2003 to 2004, um, I had actually already been blogging at the Volokh Conspiracy before that. Obviously, I stopped blogging during, during the year. Uh, but my, my experience was that the other law clerks, for the most part, were pretty... Uh, serious blog readers, uh, and and we were the kinds of people that cared about what the Supreme Court was doing, and we wanted feedback on the court's work. And if there was a smart person out there who was an expert in an ERISA case and had strong views about the briefing in an ERISA case, well, if you happen to be working on an ERISA case and there's someone who's commenting on it, it's actually pretty valuable to get that feedback. Uh, so now, of course, the nature of any commentary is it's the fact that someone in some position of influence is going to read it doesn't mean it actually influences anything. It's just exposure to that, and, and maybe it has some influence at the margins, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but law blogs are really remarkable in that the, the, there's a, a crowd of you know, the, the legal nerds who, who care about uh, that footnote in that brief and how it interestingly cited that case instead of that case. And, and so they want to talk about these issues. And so uh, those, uh, you know, some judges or law clerks may themselves find it interesting. I think from a, from a blogger standpoint, you just never know who the readers actually are. You sort of, you're, you're posting and you, you, know, you, hit, you hit send and you think, okay, well, this is my view. I don't know who's going to be reading this and who isn't. Uh, but so, so it's a conversation that maybe to an empty room, you never, you never quite know. Uh, but it's remarkable in that these conversations are occurring really in an unmediated way. And anyone can start a blog and can start commenting and anyone can read it. Uh, and it all happens instantaneously in, in a way that, that we haven't seen before. So what's distinctive about regularly blogging on legal developments is that you have to actually follow those legal developments. So when a court comes down with a decision in your area, you kind of drop everything and you read the 100-page opinion or you read the 50-page opinion and you come up with your view on it and you kind of have to do that. Uh, and I think it's very helpful for classroom discussions because you know the latest case, you can say, you know, you can, you can teach a doctrine where the Supreme Court decided two years ago that here's the framework, and you can say the lower courts have analyzed it in the following way because you have to follow those lower court cases because they're sort of in the news space that you've carved out when, in, in your blogging. Um, so in that way, I think the blogging is very helpful for teaching. In terms of scholarship, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So the great part about blogging in terms of scholarship is you're constantly thinking about new legal developments. You're always thinking about what's, how, where's this going? Uh, here's a new case. How is this similar to another new case that was six months ago? And, and, and where's the law evolving? So, so it really opens up an ability, sort of, it's like continuing research into new ideas. And you can write probably more effectively on new legal developments or the evolution of the law than you would otherwise. The downside is that it does, I think, blogging makes your focus on what's going on today. And to the extent you're trying to write an article, it's a big picture step back, um, more theoretical work, focusing on the day-to-day -day of what this district court did and what the Fourth Circuit did yesterday, you know, can get in the way, it can sort of take your focus uh, uh, away from the broader sort of long-term picture. I do think that being personally involved in legal issues, uh, litigating a case, uh, hurts scholarship on that issue. It, it, 
I've, I've done this in a few cases. I've done this uh, in the area of Fourth Amendment remedies where I argued a Supreme Court case uh, that I'd actually written an article on and wrote more on this issue. And I've done this in uh, the area of um, uh, how the Fourth Amendment applies to computers and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And it's just really tough to be able to maintain that objectivity and sense of distance that you need as an academic. And e to reconcile that with the role of an advocate, I find essentially impossible. I mean, the, the nature of being an advocate is you are thinking, what can I say that helps my side? And the nature of being a scholar is to say, what do I think is truth? Or what do I think is my minor insight which might help add to the truth? Uh, and they're just fundamentally different questions. So I, I find it really tough to write on issues where I'm litigating. Uh, it's easier to litigate on issues where I've written. It's easy, sort of a one-way street. You can go from being scholar to advocate because the scholarship has really given you a worldview in which you get all the arguments and the nuances and you know here's the best ground to defend and here's the ground you don't want to defend. But going from advocate to scholar I find incredibly difficult and I've, I've, I've tried to shy away from writing scholarship in areas where I have recently litigated because I think you end up either celebrating victories or with sour grapes over defeats and it doesn't really make for good scholarship. Um, I think it's hard to generalize how the process from input to output works at the Supreme Court because you've got nine different justices uh, and they're all individuals with their own approaches to cases, uh, different ways of thinking about the law, um, different backgrounds. And so, so I don't think there's really one answer that explains kind of how the hierarchy of legal sources translates into a decision. Um, I think in general, though, the justices are quite self-aware of who they are, what the influences are, you know, the roles of the different parts of the process. They're, they're, all, all of them are very smart uh, and, and in, a, in a way that's different from perhaps justice in the past. These justices are almost all former Court of Appeals judges. I think it's a, it's a quite significant difference. Uh, the, the fact that today, you know, I guess eight of the nine justices are former Court of Appeals judges. They've all been professionalized into the modes of judging, uh, the process of reading the briefs, of oral argument, of working with law clerks, of working with each other. Uh, they've all done this and done this very well for years uh, before they're on the Supreme Court. Uh, and so um, I think the processes are really internalized, but exactly how it works justice to justice just depends on, on that particular justice. I think on balance it's a good thing that most of the justices are former Court of Appeals judges uh, because, and this, this no doubt reflects my own values and sense of the role of the Supreme Court. I, I tend to be uh, more in the kind of judicial restraint uh, uh, side of legal debates. I think, you know, for the Supreme Court to step in and say a practice is unconstitutional uh, is, is a powerful and awesome thing to do which should uh, only be done in you know when when justified and 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 appropriate and and it's it's a pretty significant step and as a result I tend to like the idea of uh, justices that were professionalized in legal norms and are following precedents or are sort of legal technicians themselves. Uh, my sense is that individ th those who think you know it'd be better to have a politician on the court or better to have you know, someone who's coming from business or even in some cases a non-lawyer. Uh, they tend to be those that would like the Supreme Court to decide cases in a more political way or don't care that much about, uh, you know, whether all the precedents line up or maybe are less focused on the predictability of the law. Um, I, you know, sort of coming from, I guess, what you could characterize as more of a Burkean conservative sort of view, I think, you know, stability is not a bad thing. Um, uh, and I've sometimes thought, you know, may, it wouldn't be the end of the world if the Supreme Court in a particular term granted no cases. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, it'd be boring for Supreme Court commentators, but the justices would not have the opportunity to mess up the law for, for a year. So, you know, and, and it's just whenever the Supreme Court takes a case, maybe they'll improve the law, maybe they'll rationalize it, maybe they'll make it worse, maybe they'll create more questions than they answered. You never know if Supreme Court intervention is going to be a, a good thing or a bad thing. But um, having a court with legal technicians, with those that are kind of lawyers, lawyers that take legal sources really seriously, I think leads to a more predictable uh, set of opinions that leads to a, a, a higher quality set of opinions. And, and here, I think it's important to recognize the distinction between the high profile cases, the big constitutional cases, gay marriage, affirmative action. Those are the cases that everybody focuses on that get all the press attention. That's a very small part of the Supreme Court's docket. The run of the Supreme Court's docket is, you know, a bankruptcy case, a tax case, uh, a statutory interpretation case involving uh, uh, some arcane statute that nobody has, has heard about. That's most of what the Supreme Court does. And when you have, uh, you know, legal technicians, those that are sort of lawyers, lawyer, former Court of Appeals, judges types, they care about those cases. And I was very impressed when I was a law clerk that the justices cared just as much about the minor cases that no one cared about as they did the major cases that were in the news. Uh, and, and the quality of those cases that no one, that, that aren't making the news, can vary dramatically depending on the interests and skills of that justice. So I think the level of uh, Supreme Court opinions outside of the high profile cases has gone way up over the last 50 years as you've had more and more professional justices. Um, in my experience, um, everyone wants justices that are wise platonic guardians when they don't like the state of the law and think that that would mean that their sort of preferred version of the law would be enacted, and yet they want sort of technical legal uh, 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 types and those following precedent in areas where they like the body of law. So, of course, the difficulty is you can't come up with different justices for, depending on whether you like the current state of the law in one area or not, you kind of have to accept one answer across the board. Now, my, my own preference is towards uh, the Supreme Court playing a narrower role in American society. I think uh, I, I, it, this is, uh, from my perspective, reflecting basically a populist approach where I think, you know, it, 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 we live in a, a democracy, a constitutional democracy, but nonetheless, a democracy in which it should be up to the people to set the rules that they live under, uh, and the Supreme Court should only step in when uh, the Constitution, fairly construed, really says you can't do that. And in construing the Constitution, I think there should be a thumb on the scale against invading the area of democratic decision making. And again, sort of reflecting my, you know, populist uh, democratic ideals. First, I would question what it means for a branch of government to be dysfunctional. I think it's easy uh, for someone to say a branch of government is dysfunctional when it's not functioning the way they would like it to. Uh, but, you know, what, what is the standard for dysfunctional? I think in a democracy, the standard for dysfunctional, I guess, would reflect, you know, does it reflect public opinion? Uh, and, and looking at the current Congress, uh, current Congress is not enacting a lot in the way of legislation because the public is genuinely divided about what kinds of legislation should be enacted. So I, I don't think the current con Congress is dysfunctional in that, in that sense. Uh, and also, once you say a branch of government is dysfunctional, you know, if, the, if the Supreme Court steps in at that moment, it's going to step in at a time when it is making a judgment about the current Congress that will be long forgotten once that precedent is on the books. So looking back through history, we don't know if the Congress of 1932 you know, or the Congress of 1917 or 1925 was dysfunctional. We remember the Supreme Court cases that were decided, and those cases go into the books and then become uh, part of the precedents that later courts rely on to either expand or, or, or tailor those prior precedents. So I think it's wrong to look just at the current day and say, I make a, judg a judgment about the current system uh, when, when trying to figure out where the Supreme Court should go.
I, I think it's fair to view the court through a political lens. It doesn't, doesn't tell you everything you need to know about the Supreme Court, but it unfortunately tells you a lot. Um, and I mean, unfortunately, in the sense that it would be much better if a political lens were completely useless in analyzing the Supreme Court's work. But just from an outsider perspective, you know, if you look at the vote breakdown in a particular case, it often does match a fairly predictable uh, framework. Uh, and part of that, I think, is just reflecting the reality that Supreme Court justices are nominated by politicians and confirmed by politicians. It's a you know, the, the two branches of government that have their say at the outset are political branches. So it shouldn't be shocking that the individuals that are on the court, to some extent, are going to reflect the environment in which they were nominated and confirmed. Uh, but I think it's unfortunate that that lens does shed light, but it's a reality. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see a Supreme Court decision that has an unpredictable lineup, and everybody knows what the unpredictable lineup is what that means. No one says, well, unpredictable how? And everyone understands, okay, well, you've got your left of center justices and your right of center justices. And today, Justice Kennedy is, is the swing justice. We understand that framework because it happens enough that it becomes a useful heuristic when talking about the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, that does map along directly political lines. Yeah, I, I think the political lens is a tool, but can't be the only tool. So, it explains certain vote breakdowns. It explains, it's a way of thinking about how the court works. But there's so much more that goes into the justices' decisions. And, and one way of thinking about this, there's some very interesting political science research on how people view the work, uh, any political decision. There was a study done in which um, a particular policy change was suggested to uh, uh, individuals. And then they were told either that this was a Republican proposal or a Democratic proposal. And people that considered themselves Republicans supported the proposal if Republicans purported to endorse it and opposed it if Democrats uh, purported to endorse it. And the, uh, the idea is one that I think is pretty intuitive, which is that we make judgments about what is happening based on whether the people we associate with politically are bef uh, uh, in favor of it or against it, rather than in conducting kind of a first principles analysis of, of what is consistent with our values. So if you see a Supreme Court case and it divides five to four along these sort of traditional political lines and you consider yourself on one side, you're likely to see the case as a political case, as a close case, as one that involved ideology. If it's a unanimous case, you're likely to think, well, that was an easy case. That was one that maybe didn't raise any real political issues or was just sort of obvious on the law. Um, Oftentimes, though, the Supreme Court will hand down a 9-0 decision in an area that actually does have some pretty significant political valence or is quite difficult on the law. And then similarly, you'll get a 5-4 case that divides on political lines on a case that actually did not raise any particular political implications or uh, was actually pretty simple based on prior law. But we, from a public standpoint, we read the court's cases and we, we get signals about what is political or not political based on what we see as the vote breakdown, which is often quite different from a, how a case will look uh, from inside the court. I, I think the fact that Supreme Court justices are nominated by politicians and confirmed by politicians, that the the, the, the process by which they get to the court is, is a deeply political one, is going to mean that the justices themselves are going to, ref to some extent, reflect the, if not the politics of an era, some sort of ideological reflection of the era in which they were nominated. And once you get nine justices uh, appointed to the court over time, there are going to naturally be individuals that share some of those views that they've held. So there will always be some aspect of the Supreme Court which reflects um, ideologies of individuals, usually ideologies of presidents of, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 10 years ago, you know, not, not necessarily the, the kind of politics of the day. So the Supreme Court is, is not generally going to be, it's not going to be partisan in the sense of like, here are the Republicans, here are the Democrats, but you're going to, you're going to have individuals who have ideological views reflecting the moment in which they were nominated and which they were confirmed. And, and that's, you know, in part by design. I mean, if you look at, um, uh, 
this tends to, I think, be, be an issue with more valence on the Republican side. You look at Republican presidential debates when they discuss the role of the Supreme Court. Uh, and individuals are asked, you know, who would you, what kind of justice would you nominate? And they, they name, you know, I would nominate like another Justice Scalia, or I would nominate uh, another Justice Alito. They're sort of picking individuals who they see as reflecting a set of concerns and an approach and a view of the law uh, that has favor in one party and not in another. The individuals themselves are not acting politically. They, they're just doing what they think is correct. Uh, but it will have the effect over time because of the process by which they got to the Supreme Court of reflecting ideologies, which I think are fairly described as having some political valence. I think it's true that the court generally does not stray too far outside of the bounds of what is sort of generally accepted. There's been a big debate, I think really one raised by the uh, Affordable Care Act case, of sort of to what extent does the Supreme Court uh, uh, adopt views that are kind of on the wall or off the wall? Does, it, does an idea need to be mainstream before it's accepted by five justices? And I, I think just as a descriptive matter, there's a lot to that view. Um, the justices themselves are reflecting uh, you know, the, the, the world in which they see themselves, their community, the legal community, uh, you know, even more specifically, the elite legal community, the Supreme Court bar. Um, and they're in a world of, um, you know, commentary and opinion. And, and it tends to be the case that those who make it to the Supreme Court are mainstream in the sense that they're mainstream enough to be nominated and mainstream enough to be confirmed. So the individuals that make it to the Supreme Court usually are somewhere within, you know, the, the I don't know, the 20 yard line to the 20 yard line at, at the time on which they're put on the Supreme Court. Add that up and the Supreme Court requires five justices. They're not going to go in a place that's kind of radically out of step uh, with, with public opinion, at least of the opinion of those who nominated them and confirmed them. I think it's hard to change that dynamic. It's just inherent in having a politician nominate a justice and having politicians confirm them that you'll you'll have that. And, and to some extent, it acts on a check between a check on the the um, the the power of the court to strike down legislation. That you know, it's it's it's. And I'm not saying this is the ideal system I would design, but in a weird way, it sort of works that. You know, the, the, the justices should stay within the lines and should not be aggressive in, in enforcing their policy views and reading their own views into the Constitution. And at the same time, as a practical matter, they're likely to reflect some sort of a democratic norm in the collective because they are ultimately reflecting views of uh, politicians who were popularly elected. So um, it's a, you know, it. it the sausage making may not be very uh, uh, appealing, but the system as a whole more or less works. Um, uh, with that said, I think there are real, you know, there are a lot of debates as to the proper role of the Supreme Court, and they are absolutely live and valid and important debates. Um, the system works kind of over time, but not in a very pretty way. I actually think the nomination and confirmation process works pretty well. Um, some expect the process to be this glorious academic enterprise in which we look deeply into the soul of the nominee and the nominee shares their innermost thoughts. And um, we, we've never had that with one exception, the nomination of Robert Bork. Um, uh, that's not the historical norm. The historical norm is not even to have uh, hearings, live hearings. So, uh, so um, th the process today, though, I think works quite well. I mean, we, it, again, it depends on your standards, but we... We, I think in general, have seen pretty high quality nominees representing the views of the president who is nominating them. Uh, you know, the, I think today's justices are on the whole the smartest set of nine justices uh, we've seen, or at least way, way up there relative to the historical norm. Um, and um, the confirmation process is an opportunity for the public to get exposed to what the Supreme Court does. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for the two parties to kind of define the role of the Supreme Court, what they think is important. And an interesting example of this, I think, is the two most recent 
uh, Supreme Court confirmations, those of Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor, both featured extensive, extensive discussion of the Second Amendment. Um, that may seem sort of surprising in some sense because there have not been, it's not historically been an issue that, that nominees were asked about, and it's reflecting recent case law developments, the Heller case and, and the uh, McDonald versus City of Chicago case. Uh, but it's also a way in which uh, one party, in this case the Republican Party, can show that it considers the Second Amendment to be a really important constitutional right. And, and in effect, it is, it is a way in which the public is having the opportunity to influence views of constitutional law by putting forward a vision of how the Constitution works for you know, the, 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 the senators are putting this forward for the public and the justices, the nominees are being told, you know, this is very important to our side, effectively, or to our constituents. Um, and it's a way in which the public, I think, has an impact on constitutional meeting, which strikes me in a system where, again, the, a politician nominates and politicians confirm as actually a way in which the system works. So it's not, it's not highbrow theory, uh, and it's not, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey sort of let me, you know, tell you my innermost secrets, but it's, it's, it's a way in which the public impacts how the Supreme Court looks at its job and influences, I think, ultimately how the Constitution is construed. Yeah, I think the labels, the Roberts Court, the Rehnquist Court, the Warren Court, uh, they're helpful in that ultimately the Supreme Court consists of nine people and, and it takes five to form a majority. And five justices today can have a very different set of views uh, about a wide range of issues than five justices 50 years ago or 20 years ago or even five years ago. Uh, and as a result, it's helpful to think of not just the court or a court, but rather as this group of nine people, or in some cases five people, um, and 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 to see them as kind of their own entity. And 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 I can give an example of where I think it's really helpful. I teach criminal procedure, and the the field of criminal procedure is largely the product of the Warren Court. And you can't understand criminal procedure decisions well if you don't understand how different justices came along and replaced other justices, how, uh, you know, when Justice Frankfurter departed uh, uh, and, and then was replaced by Justice Goldberg, how that changed the court, how the, suddenly there was a five justice majority that had just a different set of views than there was before, and how when um, Nixon came along and he had his nominees, how suddenly there was no longer um, a five justice majority, and and to understand where um, the Reagan administration was in terms of its approaches, for example, to the exclusionary rule. I think that really explains where the Supreme Court of today is on these questions. Uh, so to understand kind of the arc of history and the shifting majorities on the court, it's helpful just to use labels. I mean, you could be really specific and say, you know, the 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 court from this term to that term that had a following group of justices. It was just too confusing. It's easier to just use the label of the, 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 the Warren court or the Burger court, and, and it's not a bad heuristic to try to understand the court changing over time. Yeah. One thing that I didn't appreciate until I was a law clerk was the extent to which the justices are generalists. So I think I had an impression, especially as a law student, and I see this in my own students, that the justices have strong views on every issue and they, they remember everything they ever wrote, you know, going back to 1975, that dissent that they wrote and that, um, you know, uh, uh, tax case. And uh, you just sort of imagine that they have, you know, clear agendas and a sense of I'm going from here to here to here. That's not generally the case. It's not the norm. The norm is that they're generalist justices. They, they get their docket, uh, which they're mostly picking based on circuit splits. So it's really the lower courts that are generating the Supreme Court's docket by creating disagreement in the lower courts. They get a tray of cases that, of that particular sitting and 
there are an incredibly wide range of issues. One is an administrative law issue, one's a standing issue, one's a statutory question, uh, one's an Article III jurisdictional issue, a criminal case, and they go into each case and they try to figure out their views of that case and then the opinion is done and if most of them are not writing on any particular issue um, and and then they're done and then they move on to the next case and there's an incredibly wide range of issues that they get so the justices themselves are at least m my sense of it is they're not acting in this strategic way they're not sort of scheming thinking aha we want to get to here to get to there because they are by nature generalists. So they're taking it case by case uh, and and they don't know what the composition of the court might look like when the issue comes back up. So they're not even able to think in that kind of strategic way for the most part. So, so you know, they're really just looking case by case. They're generalists. They look at each case on its own. So I think it's important to see that, uh, you know, the Burger Court is not one general thing. It is, here are the individuals and here are the issues that they uh, decided and here's how they came out in these individual cases and absolutely you can see trends in the same way you can look at the writing of uh, 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 a, an author or the works of art of a painter and say here are the consistent themes of that uh, individual in that same way you can look at consistent themes of a nine justice group uh, but it's it's wrong to think of what they're doing as part of this grand tactical scheme, and I, I think with with a few exceptions, and and you know the the Warren Court uh, and issues of race in the 1950s and 60s is is a is an ex exception to that, uh, but it's generally not that way today. I think the Fourth Amendment is an interesting example because it is inherently responsive to technological change. Uh, the Fourth Amendment deals with investigations. Investigations deal with the technologies that people are using, and that's both individuals using technologies like cell phones or the police using technologies like thermal imaging devices. Uh, and so cases are constantly coming up and bubbling up to the justices, raising the application of new technologies. Uh, and the nine generalist justices, for the most part, uh, they're not technical experts, certainly. They don't have a technological background. Uh, and they're not particularly invested in or have a view of how the law should respond to technological change. Um, and so I think it leads to open-minded justices in a surprising way. And an example of this, I think, is the recent GPS decision, United States versus Jones. Um, no, th in that case, the Supreme Court rules 9-0 in favor of a criminal defendant who was involved in a massive narcotics conspiracy. Uh, and his car had been monitored for 28 days, and the justices divided as to why there was a search uh, in the installation and use of the GPS device on his car, uh, r fairly evenly between those thinking it's a search to install the device and those thinking it's a search to use the device over time. Um, that was not a case where looking at the precedents, you'd have said it should be 9-0. It was actually uh, just purely from a presidential standpoint, sort of pointed vaguely in the government's favor, uh, but not clearly, and, and it was just sort of an open question. That, I think the fact that that was a 9-0 decision is reflecting the fact that the nine justices are coming to these issues in a fairly fresh way and looking at these dynamics and saying, where, where should the law go? Uh, wh wh how should this timeless principle of the Fourth Amendment respond to this new technology. Uh, and they were doing so in ways that were not simply kind of reflecting the usual ideological, you know, sort of backgrounds. It wasn't like, you know, the pro-government uh, justices went in one direction, the pro-defense justices went in the other direction. Instead, it was all nine justices sort of grappling with these technological changes. And, and I think that's an area, it, my, my prediction at least, is that we're seeing really the first of a long series of cases involving how the Fourth Amendment applies to computer technologies, digital technologies, other new new technologies, uh, because so much of the investigations have turned in that direction. So often the government is looking for digital evidence and it raises so many new questions. It's gonna, I think it's gonna occupy the justices over the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years uh, in, in a fairly wide range of cases.
uh, in 2011, I published an article called An Equilibrium Adjustment Theory of the Fourth Amendment. So it, it had everything, theory in the title, a fancy name, but his basic idea as to how the Supreme Court tends to uh, interpret the Fourth Amendment in light of technological change, which is that the justices tend to be quite naturally attuned to ways in which technology and, and common practice shifts the balance of power between the government and the citizen. So sometimes technology uh, increases the power of government to watch what people are doing. Sometimes technology uh, decreases that ability. And, and I think the, the justices are attuned to those changes and tend to tailor constitutional Fourth Amendment doctrine to try to restore something like an original balance or some sort of uh, balance uh, of police power uh, and, and I suspect they will continue to do so in the technological setting. And that, that'll come up, I think, in a lot of different ways. So one way it comes up in the cases that were recently uh, granted, the cell phone search cases, is you know, searching a cell phone is a lot more invasive than searching a physical pocket or a crumpled cigarette package, uh, to use the example from a 1973 case, uh, United States versus Robinson. Uh, and so we're dealing with a legal rule, you can search property on a person incident to arrest that just has a very different meaning today than it had in 1973 because people are carrying so much more information than they had. Uh, so I suspect that the justices will be attuned to that difference and will say, okay, the rule in 1973 made sense for the facts of 1973, but striking that balance today requires understanding that cell phones are just a game changer. They're really different in terms of the amount of information they can store and that some sort of a modified rule for searching electronic evidence is required. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's sort of adjusting, the, the, the general principles are timeless, but the applications of those principles vary depending on facts that change over time.